My name is Maria Ilush. I study at UCLA. My major is Chicano Chicana Studies, and I'm a senior. Growing up, I was very heavily involved with my Arab community and with the Muslim community. My dad is an activist, my mom is a public school teacher. I knew that eventually I wanted to do work with, you know, um, underserved communities. I was born and raised in America. My mom is Mexican-American and my dad is Syrian-American. So growing up, I had like this hybridity of being, of two very different cultures, but that are actually very similar in a lot of ways. There's this like, misconception that anyone who wears a hijab is Arab. Arabs are not even the majority of Muslims. But when people do guess I'm Arab, they're 50% correct. It kind of throws them off when I say that I'm Mexican. Actually, sometimes when I tell people that I'm Mexican Arab, um, they say, how can you be Mexican but also Muslim? <laughs> and I said, actually, you can be both. I feel like in this day and age, every single aspect of my identity is being attacked. From my Muslim side, we have Islamophobia, which is rampant right now. From my Mexican side, we have you know, anti-immigration rhetoric, we have anti-Mexican rhetoric, and then being a woman, you know, we're in a day and age where um, gender inequality is unacceptable, and, you know, women are, are speaking out against that and demanding equality. Um, and so I feel that right now, every element of my being is being attacked, and the result of that is really me dedicating my life to fixing that. I wasn't really given any guidance with how to approach, you know, hate comments, Islamophobia, you know, racism. A couple of months ago, I was sitting in Santa Monica, sitting outside, I'm reading a book, and a man passes by my table and um, like stares at me with a very angry stare. I felt very cautious of myself and until the gentleman said um, in a very loud voice to everyone surrounding him, who does she think she is sitting here? How do they let some Arab bitch sit here? When I look up, I see this gentleman like running towards me. He pushes the table that I'm sitting at at me. I grab my things and I just get up very startled and very surprised. At that point it was like, I, I felt fight or flight, like I, I just needed to get out of there. From that experience, what I learned was, it doesn't matter what city you're in. I was in liberal Santa Monica and it doesn't matter if there's people around you. This was in broad daylight on a Sunday in a very touristy area and there were people around me. No one said anything. And then I reported it to the police and you know what, the police didn't even wanna write it down as a hate crime. And it was until I asked the police officer for her identification number that she finally actually put it onto record. If you are wearing a hijab, you are an open target. When I was a freshman in high school, I had just put on the hijab, the Islamic headscarf, and I noticed that the biggest issue was there was no businesses or companies catering to Muslim women. That's what really inspired me to start it, that alongside with being in a high school fashion class. But once I started, I didn't realize how much it would pick up and how almost viral it would become among Muslim Americans because none, nothing like that had existed before. And also, we try to make a brand that um, allows Muslim women to feel as American as they do Muslim. It's important that Muslim women feel like their hijab can blend in with their fashion identity and with their careers and with just um, utility. A lot of them are in the workforce. I mean, alongside with being a business that sells headscarves, we also like to engage with the community. And one of the ways we do that is we partner up with universities that hold hijab days, or, or what I like to call hijab solidarity days. This is a chance for us to um, sponsor universities with headscarves and for them to put on events where they allow other um, classmates and colleagues um, to wear the hijab for the day, wear the headscarf. And when they're wearing it in their everyday classrooms, you know, and they're getting asked questions and they're answering it on our behalf, they're really doing us a favor, you know, and they're kind of creating a norm for the hijab, the headscarf. And what that does in return is that it helps Muslim women be less of a target. You know, you're answering a lot of these questions of the unknown. I think the biggest resource that if somebody in America wants to know about Muslims in America in general, it would be, you know, either a local mosque or CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations. They are kind of the forefront um, nonprofit work um, organization doing advocacy work. They work with the youth, they work with professionals, they work with major donors. I mean, they and they have access to, you know, politicians. So they're kind of our forefront organization representing American Muslims. I realize that this is probably a field that I want to work in, um, working with underserved communities, specifically um, the Muslim community, because that's where I, what I grew up in. 
the Latino, Latina community, you know, any underserved community that exists. And, and I think the biggest thing right now is allyship and coalitions. You know, individually, minority groups don't really have the biggest voice. But if each one of us, you know, the black community, Latinos, Latinas, um, Muslims, um, if, if, and many other, many other that I'm not mentioning right now, if we all get together and um, demand equality and our voice and resources, um, then I'm sure that we will be able to have change institutionally. I think Muslim women who wear hijab right now are experiencing some sort of confusion with their American identity and it's important that we have unity and, and a solid sisterhood that guides us towards any hurdles that comes up in the near future. Change in color. Change in color.